Good evening, brother and sister in Christ. Welcome to Patani Baptist Church Sunday evening online service. We hope that everyone is doing well in this time of pandemic. Before we start our worship, let us commit this time to prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for gathering us from everywhere for this evening service. We also thank you for providing our daily needs. We pray, Lord, that you can continue to strengthen our faith in this hard time. Thank you, Lord, and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's been 
Today we will be reading from Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 21. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on Sabbath day he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. May God bless the reading of his word. Hi, good evening, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I hope everyone is in a good health and uh, glad to see you again in this online worship service tonight. Well, last week, Dr. Tan shared with us about life journey. And in the life journey, you know, we have to decide and pack only what is important to us. And in that journey, I believe at some point of time, so many of us would stop and ask a very question. Why am I here? Why am I exist? Some have found it while others still searching. Maybe others find it rather mind-boggling and difficult and have stopped looking for the answer. So we see, why is a hard question and critical one? Now, if you are able to find the why, then what and how will be easy. For example, our life consists of different habits and these habits are powerful factors that direct the course of our life. And for the habit, see, the habit consists of three components, the knowledge, skill, and desire. And among the three, you need to have the knowledge of why too. You need to know why am I doing this as to make the habit stay. So when we're able to find the reason for why we need to do certain things, then the next, to find the skill and desire that is easy. For example, this year we have started the Bible reading program. And how many of us have instilled that habit of Bible reading? unless you are able to answer why reading Bible is important and beneficial to you, no, you will never form that habit of reading. On the other hand, if you are able to find the answer why, then the next two questions are much easier to handle. You know, what to read and how to do Bible reading. And so in the quest of looking for the answer of why, Sometimes you see many choose to walk on a much easier path. And many would go to look for how rather than why. Now, if you want to publish a book, a best-selling book, I would advise you to start with the how. How to become millionaire in five years. How to win in every sales. How to be successful in life insurance or how to live a successful Christian life. And people are looking for a quick fix, but they have forgotten the answer. The why is more critical than anything else. And that's also explain why prosperity gospel is also is so popular. Because basically, prosperity gospel is focused much on the technique of how and what rather than why. And so tonight as we come together, we want to embark a journey to look for the answer why. No, you want to ask two, two critical questions about church. Number one, why does church exist? And number two, why does the church exist on earth in space and time? Many of us receive our salvation at the different stages of our life. 
some during their teenage, some in, in during their adult. But along the way, see, somehow God had put you and me in this church. So have you ever wondered why God put us together in Bethany Baptist Church? Does God has a purpose for you and me? And tonight, as you go through these two questions, hopefully the Holy Spirit will open our eyes to see the special purpose God has for us. Look at this picture. This is one of Michelangelo's masterpiece. You know, Michelangelo was a very famous artist and he produced many pieces of art. And this is one of his uh, favorite. And in this picture is a creation. The title is a, is a creation of Adam that adorns the Sistine Chapel. So what does it mean? You know, when we talk about masterpiece, See, masterpiece means a work done with extraordinary skill, especially for supreme intellectual or artistic achievement. So in other words, the creator put all his effort into this creation, which could reflect his perfection in the work he does. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, here we find a grand vision of God's plan for the body of Christ. A vision full with implication both for eternity and for here and now. And according to Paul, the church is the masterpiece of workmanship of God. And since it is the masterpiece of God, surely God had an intended purposes for the church. And in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it begins with the explosion of praise. In Ephesians 1, it's filled with a vision of praise of God's glory and the praise of his glorious grace and so on. God does all things according to his own pleasure and works all things in accordance according to his own good pleasure. So all of this clear affirmation of our earlier assertion that church exists, ultimately for the glory of our God, praise him for his glorious grace. And with this in mind, we turn to the second essential question. Why does church exist in space and time. See, why we are here at this moment? Why must the church endure the trouble and often painful? Sometimes, you know, we feel trapped on this earth. Like I mentioned just now, if our ultimate end is to bring glory to and fully enjoy God forever, why does God not simply take us to be with him face to face immediately upon our conversions so that we can you know, praise him and be with him forever. Why? And so one way to approach to this concern is to ask a similar question about Jesus Christ. You know, why did the eternal son of God leave the glory and splendor of unbroken fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven to sojourn among us for a few decades. Answering the question about his earthly sojourn will help us understand our own as well. The Bible has much to say concerning the motive for the incarnation of Jesus. And here are some pieces of this mystery. And it says here, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus came to seek and to save what was lost. God so loved the world that he gave his only and begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
And here is a trustworthy saying that deserve full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The reason of the Son of God appear was to destroy the devil's work. So from this, from this, from the above, we can begin to understand some of the principal motive for the incarnation. Simply put, Jesus became human. No, it's to redeem human, to redeem us, and to reconcile us back to God and to one another. See, our relationship has been broken and Jesus came so that you no, know, he can restore that kind of relationship for us back to God and for us with, each, uh, with one another. And these emphasis are clearly seen in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 21. See, regarding the mission of Jesus. And the story is situated near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Look at the beginning. And he has been baptized by John and pastored by the devil. And he now returns to his hometown of Nazareth in the power of the Spirit and goes where he had always gone on the Sabbath to the synagogue. And it was given to him to read a passage in Isaiah. Now we know the text he read was taken from Isaiah 61 uh, verses 1 to 2. And he says here, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoner, to proclaim the years of the Lord's favor. See, all of this became dramatically manifest in the subsequent earthly ministry of Jesus. It was fulfilled during Jesus' time. But as you look at the passage in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2, is it as significant as what Jesus did read from Isaiah's scroll is what he did not read on that occasion. And this is something we miss out. You see, he stopped his reading abruptly in mid-sentence, Isaiah 61 2 goes on to say, if you look at the slide, it says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So before reaching this word, however, you see in the book of Luke, Luke recorded that Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it to the attendants, and sat down, and went on to say, with all eyes fixed on him. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God that Jesus had come to fulfill was a word of good news, a proclamation of an extended time of God's favor. He had not come in in his first advent to execute God's vengeance nor had he come to bring final comfort to all who mourn. For fulfillment of all these things, we eagerly await the second coming of the Lord. So the last part is it will only happen when Jesus comes the second time. So very clearly, Jesus comes is to bring the good news, proclamation of an extended time of God's favor. And the Bible portrays that coming day, you know, the last day, as one of both horror and hope. For those on whom the wrath of God falls, it is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And for those whose names are written in God's book, it is a blessed hope. And in either case, it is not this day, 
we, as the children of God who live between the first and the second coming of our Lord, are living still in the year of the Lord's favor. We are still living in the Lord in the year of the Lord's favor. Let us remember that. So, in other words, the anger of the Lord had not come to us. So, what should we do? What should we do now? It's almost equal to the question: why does church exist in space and in time? The implications of this for the ministry of the church are profound. See. The term that the Apostle Paul often used uh, to describe the great mission of Jesus with a view of both his first and second coming is reconciliation. So before we explore Paul's vision of reconciliation, now we will answer another variation on why question. And that is why reconciliation. Why the work of reconciliation? To answer that, I think we have to go back to the time of creation. See, in the beginning, we were told that God, that all that God created was good. Now, who is within his triune self, the ultimately relational one? created human to be his image and likeness. And human too, you know, were relational being from the start. And all first men and women were in harmony with each other, at peace with the creation and the other creatures, at peace with themselves in the wonderful, harmonious relationship with the living God. So you can see in the beginning, everything was created in a very harmonious condition. However, when you come to Genesis 3, it records the tragic turn of event that would change the course of our history. Through the rebellious act of Adam and Eve, sin, enter human's world. And all the relationships characterized by harmony are now marked instead of bitter and meaty. See, there start the blaming game. The man suggested that the woman is responsible for their plight. And then the woman shift the blame to the animal. And there is also a conflict within their own hearts. A kind of internal Enmity. See, the man and woman had formerly been described as naked and they felt no shame. But now they are troubled by their nakedness and they take steps to clothe themselves. Most significantly, their relationship with God is now radically altered. They are afraid of Him and hid from His present. The harmonious scene in the Garden of Eden is no longer exist. So you can see here from harmony, it has turned to a sense of enmity. But this is not how the story of Genesis proceeds. Instead, God began a new and great work, the work of reconciling all things to himself. He himself provides a suitable covering for the nakedness of the human. He also pronounces the consequences for the action on each of them. So it is in the face of all this enmity that God begins the great work of reconciliation. And by Genesis 3, the God begins the work of restoring, redeeming, reconciling all things. Firstly, he raises up for himself a people of his own, Israel, to be the light to the nation. 
Then within his people, he raises up prophets and other teachers to declare his will in and through his people. And finally, from Israel, in the fullness of time, he brings forth his own son to fully effect the reconciliation of all things to himself. Jesus' incarnation, his dwelling among us was largely motivated by this ministry of reconciliation. And in John 5, see, Jesus heals a man who had been lame for 38 years. And questioned by the religious authority about having done this work on Sabbath, Jesus answered, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. The context of John 5 helps us to understand that God is always engaged in this work of reconciliation. It was such for such work that Jesus had come at the bidding of his father. And Jesus' earthly life was devoted to the work of love, healing, deliverance, and mercy, as we have seen. The climatic work of reconciliation that he had performed, however, was in his death, dying on the cross for us. Jesus bore our sins away forever, reconciled us both to God, and to one another. So this is basically the work of Jesus. He wants to reconcile us back to God, besides you know, providing us a, a salvation, redeem, redeem us from our sin. And finally, see, we now return to the question that led us to this entire line of inquiry. Why does the church exist on earth? in this space and time. See, the answer is that there is an already and a not yet of reconciliation. There is also an even now. Now, we all know that Christ performed his work of reconciliation on the cross. But it is obvious that reconciliation had not been fully worked out, fully and practically in either earthly or heavenly experience. Therefore, see, we exist in the between of the time of already and not yet. That is now. And this is the theological tension that we are in. In one sense, it looks like we already possess it. In another, these reconciliation experiences are not fully manifested. Jesus has come to do his father's work. That is good works of reconciliation. This he did in life and in death by means of his physical body. And with the same physical body, he suffered and died in our place, reconciling the world to God. But in the meantime, by God's grace, by God's gracious invitation to us, we have work to do. Jesus continued his great reconciling work in even now through his spiritual body, the church. We are his spiritual body. And the church exists in this time and in this space because of the even now commission to Christ's ministry of reconciling. And in, in closing, you know, we could see this purpose very clearly as described by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. You see, we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. And we all know our salvation is entirely by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And by the grace of God, we are saved from sin, spiritual death, and the coming wrath of God. But we want to ask 
what are we safe for? What are we safe for? See, we, are, we have been told we have been safe from sin. Now we want to ask the question, what are we safe for? And Ephesians 2.10 eliminates this. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, we are safe entirely apart from any work of our own, but we are safe in order to walk in good work. And this good work include both testifying the reality of our faith and of our identity as God's children. And as our Father in heaven always at work, we too, as his spiritual body on earth, will continue to work on the ministry of reconciliation, for this is the whole purpose of our existence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. And it helps us to remember, Lord, the very reason of our existence. The very reason, Lord, you established church on this earth is to continue the work of Christ, the work of reconciliation. And help us to be obedient and not. And not to just sit around and doing nothing. But Lord, you want to go out and proclaim your word. And through all the good work that we have done a lot, we will be able to draw the people back to you, to reconcile the world back to you. And this is your heart's desire. We thank you a lot for we have been called and be able to join you in this ministry. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God of heaven living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at your throne.
Now, in closing, let us all receive the blessing of God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit continue to be with you from now till forevermore. Amen. Now, good night, everyone, and I hope to see you in a short while through our Zoom meeting. Stay safe and God bless.